very good presenter. Now he hasn't so much of uh, what he's talking about is the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he has a really good manner for presenting things in a in a simple way. I mean, just a, in a straightforward way. A person who a person who doesn't know that material, doesn't know the Bible, would be able to follow it well. And that's an unusual talent. <laughs> yeah, that's an unusual talent. That. There, um, there are some really great preachers that they're just difficult to follow. <laughs> they said that they used to say that about Wendell Winkler. That is a great, knowledgeable preacher, but just hard to follow. Hard, just it was. He was. You had to know a lot to start following him, even. Well. Um, trying to think of what news there is from over the weekend. Uh, Tom Mack's dad had a stroke uh, over in Alabama, and they've gone over to uh, look after him. It sounds like it was pretty bad, at least the last I heard from Tom, is his dad's not able to speak. Um, but, you know, it's early days, so it's early days yet, so we can pray for there to be improvement on that. And I'm trying to think what else is going on. I don't think we have anybody in the, else in the hospital or anything, anything new there anyway. Of course, Jason goes to get his uh, heart catheterization this Friday. And he said, you know, they, as usual with a thing like that, they may, if they feel like they need to put in a stent, they'll go ahead and do it then. Might as well. <laughs> Already in there, you might as well do it. And uh, so hopefully that'll get, uh, you know, hopefully they won't have to do much anything. But I told Jason, there's just no justice. You know, there's no justice about things like that because here he's tried to lose weight and take care of himself and he ends up with that. And then there's me and I had to have some cardio work done in the last few months because of a, uh, I have a congenital weirdness in the, like one side of the heart fires a little out of phase from the other. <laughs> it, just, a, just a fraction out of phase. It's a, a lot of people have it. I can't remember what they call it, but um, it, it's not as serious as it sounds like. And it turned up when I was it turned up when I was forty, but the doctor didn't get the records transferred over, so they found this again. And said, "No, we have to check this all out." And I said, okay, so I got a complete I got a complete checkup of my heart, and they said, no, "You don't have any plaque or anything. It all looks good, and there's just this thing's probably been that way since you were born." So <laughs> it wasn't any news to me, but they had to go look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not an arrhythmia. It's not an arrhythmia. It all, it, it's just the, the two sides are supposed to contract at the same time, at the same side, and it's like one side is just tiny fraction late. But they say it's always been that way, and you no, know, it hasn't bothered me yet. <laughs> if I was going to be an Olympic runner, it might be a problem. <laughs> don't think there's any danger of that. <laughs> I, I don't think there's any, if I were going to be a, some sort of major athlete, it would be difficult, but maybe that's why I never was any good in sports. That must be it. <laughs> that must be it. It's got nothing to do with having no coordination. <laughs> well, let's, let's have a prayer before we get started. God, we thank you for the day that you've blessed us with, and we uh, we pray your blessing on the Mac family. We pray for Tom's dad that he'll get better. And we pray you watch over them while they're away from us. 
we pray that you'll be with Jason as he goes through this procedure and we pray that all will go well and they'll be able to clear things up quickly. Father, thank you for all your loving kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we come now to looking at the, the Holy Spirit within the Trinity, which I'm not planning to go into all of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian, for example. That's an, kind of another subject. Um, and, um, but rather looking at the, what the Bible tells us about the Holy Spirit within the Trinity and the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the Father and the Son. So it's kind of a different sort of study, although to some extent you can't separate the two things. And I'd kind of like to just look at a whole bunch of verses, and we'll go through them in, in the order as they appear in the Bible. first one's in Matthew chapter 3. And as I, as I will often do when I'm not sure exactly how to start approaching a subject, I just start looking at, well, look, let's try to find everything the Bible says about this thing. <laughs> and then start carefully looking at that and, well, does this really apply to what, does this, does this really have to do with what I'm looking at or not? And then try to see and that's, you know, that's a, got to be sure you're not taking things out of context, but there's always a danger in that. But I think we see some, some patterns here that can be helpful. And I want to look first at the Father and the Spirit. And then the Son and the Spirit. And that maybe is enough for now. So uh, starting in Matthew 3, Matthew 3 and 16, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And verse 17, Behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This is one of those fascinating places where you see all three persons of the Trinity at once. The Father from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. The Spirit and it's called the Spirit of God. And right away, my literal mind, you know, I get, I get paid to be picky about things at my job. I get paid to be really, really picky, like about, about things about music and history. Uh, I saw the, the remake of the movie True Grit, where they used the songs... Um, what a friend we have in Jesus in that song. And I'm saying to myself, this story is set in 1873. That song wasn't written for another 20 years. <laughs> I get paid to think about things like that. Then I told myself, well, but it's, it's the character is retelling the story when she's an older woman. And so that song was written by the time she's retelling the stories. In my head, that makes it all balance out and work. I, I, get paid to, I get paid to think about things like that. So I notice that, well, Spirit of God, does that mean the Father? Or does when Spirit of God mean Spirit of the Father? Or? Don't know. Now in this verse, in this verse, we have the Father speaking to the Son and the Spirit descending. And so when it says the Spirit of God descending, it seems like that's saying he's the Spirit coming from the Father in some sense. But there's a lot of times, a lot of places that refer to the Spirit of God and doesn't really say that that's some special relationship of the Spirit to the Father. 
Now that may be a split, splitting a hair that doesn't need to be split. It may, it may not matter, just put that there for, for sake of, uh, of pointing it out, that I don't want to just assume that that means the Father every time. Matthew chapter 10, moving forward here, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 20, Jesus is giving instructions to the apostles before he sends them out on their um, first missionary, um, little short missionary trip around the, the cities of Galilee. Verse 20 says, For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So there the Spirit is called the, the Spirit of the Father. <laughs> As though the, the Spirit is somehow specially representing the Father in that work. Uh, another, probably a page over or so, chapter 12. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 12 and verse 18, Jesus is quoting from Isaiah and applying that to himself. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So if Jesus is the servant, then that's got to be the father talking, right? Now stop me. <coughs> Sorry. Now stop me if, this doesn't make, if that doesn't make sense. But if Jesus is the servant then that is the Father talking about putting his spirit upon him. I think that makes sense. It's uh, chapter 12, verse 18. And there are a lot of places in the Old Testament that talk about, the, about uh, God putting his spirit upon a person or the Spirit fell upon a person. Even Saul, uh, the Spirit fell on him. And um, David, certainly. So here Jesus is applying this to himself and it kind of indicates the, that the Father has chosen the servant in this sense that he will put his Spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Uh, of course, this is quoting a poetic passage from prophecy from the Old Testament and reapplying it in the New Testament, so I don't want to you know, make too much of that, but I um, don't want to split hairs about the words there, but it does kind of indicate a relationship of the Spirit to the Father as the Father sending the Spirit. Verse 28 in the same passage um, Jesus has been accused of casting out demons by Beelzebul, which is one of the, that's just got to be one of the dumbest things that, <laughs> I, I, well, and he points it out, of course, that, you know, you don't really even make any sense. <laughs> Think about what you just said. You didn't, that doesn't really make any sense. But, um, Jesus says in verse 28, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that telling us that the Spirit of God is, Jesus is speaking of the Spirit of God, not his, the Spirit from himself, but rather the Spirit coming from the Father, and that by the power of the Spirit, Jesus is casting out demons, which is kind of interesting idea. As so we think about Jesus having the authority to do it, but then this also talks about the Spirit of God being the means by which. Well, there's really not any separation between those things, is there? It's just different ways of talking about the same thing. All right. Mm -hmm. 
And so... It's a way that the Bible talks about that, yeah. So, and I know, and I know that a lot of us don't really understand how, how, it, how it's all connected, but um, the verse that speaks about God um, allowing those secret things let God have his secret things. Like there are things that mm -hmm. we're just not meant to truly understand. We just have that faith. Yeah. Could that could this be one of those things, even though we need to understand it's mm -hmm. there. And it, it's oh, I absolutely God. agree with that. But because there are people, non believers, that they they base their whole faith on whether they're gonna obey the gospel on if you're able to explain this to them. Yeah. Because well. they're like, I don't understand the Trinity. Tell me how. Tell me how the Holy Spirit works. Like, how are they all one? And if you're not mm -hmm. going to answer it, they will not obey the gospel. Yeah. And um, I don't know where this verse is in the Old Testament. It's uh, 2929. The secret things belong to God. Yeah. And I, I don't know if that'll be a good yeah. answer for them, but it will be good for for us to understand, like, how to answer people mm -hmm. when, because. The, this is such a good topic, but, but it's so hard to explain. It's complicated. It's and there are, and we, we, we quickly come to a place that say, well, this is, and that's, that's why I started doing this this way, <laughs> is, okay, the Bible says this. I'm absolutely sure that the Bible says this in this verse. Mm -hmm. And it says the same thing here and the same thing here and the same thing here. But you can real quick, real quickly, we come to a place where we can ask questions that, well, I just don't know. I just don't, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Um, there are a lot of things like that, though. Like, how does your spirit dwell in your body? That's something that the, the materialist, the person who believes only in matter, energy, things that can be measured and, and explained by science, they say, well, prove to me that there's a soul. And what they mean is, well, prove to me by the things that I accept of ways to measure matter and energy and things in the material world, prove to me by that that there's a soul. And of course, by definition, I can't do that because we're talking about something that's not part of that world. <laughs> so uh, that's... You know, you kind of have to go in the realm of philosophy to talk about the soul, not, not science. And that, to some people, that is a stumbling block. And, um, but if a person accepts the idea that, if a person will accept the idea that, well, but I believe, I, I understand that I have a soul, mm -hmm. that there's something more important, that there's something more to me than just I just am this thing that because, because of, I don't know, somebody sneezed and my ancestor went left instead of right and therefore by I was born and <laughs> generations later I was born in a certain place and grew up thinking certain things and that's why I'm saying the things I'm saying right now. It's all, you know, a determinist point of view that we're all just parts of a machine um, well, if, yeah, I mean, to some extent, if a person, and there are better arguments than this, I'm sure, but if a person wants to believe that we're all just parts of a machine, it's really hard to talk them out of it. I just say, you know, it's like, it's like uh, predestination. If a person, it's kind of like when my sister would say things like, I made you do that. And I say, no, you didn't. Well, I made you say that, too. <laughs> you, you can't win that argument. There is a God. Yeah. And we know that we're not just... Right. And we know that we're not just animals. We know because if somebody does something bad to me or someone I love, I feel like that's not right. Well, really, why is that not right? If we're all just animals, why is that not right? 
What difference does it make? What difference does it make if somebody takes something from me except I just don't like it? But we feel like, no, that's, it's, and, and it's, it's kind of like uh, Tom Warren's debate with Anthony Flew back in the 70s. He really put Flew back in a corner with the question about the Nazis who, at the Nuremberg trials after the war, said we were following orders. We were following the laws of our government. We didn't break the law. They were in executing millions of people in the, in the concentration camps. They said, we were following orders. We didn't break the law. What are you accusing us of? And a, I can't remember the man's name now. He was uh, Robert, it's a real common name and I can't ever remember what it is, who was the prosecutor on that day was, uh, I think he was an American uh, Supreme Court Justice, said there is a law higher than, that there is a higher law than the laws of man. And that's really what it comes down to. And Warren th put that to Flew. Well, Flew had served in the war, fought for England in the war, and he was too good a man to just back up and say that, well, they really didn't do anything wrong because there's no there's no real moral right or wrong. Flu still believed that the Nazis were wrong. <laughs> he just dodged around that question. Uh, Warren kind of pinned him for a while and then let him up. <laughs> he let him back up after a while, made his point that, no, you know that's wrong. Well, why is it wrong? Just because you don't like it or because it's actually wrong? Who says? God says. That's, that's, there are things like that, and yeah, sorry, you can get me off on this for a long time because I'm in the humanities and this is also a problem in the academic world that science makes money. <laughs> science makes money, whether it's moral or not. And I, I love science and I, I'm very interested in a lot of areas of science. I think it's wonderful that We've made so many, we've wiped out so many diseases. We've been able to do so many things that, um, that are positive. But the, when science is completely split from what makes us human, that's when people start doing things that, that's when people start going into areas in science that you think, wait a minute, did anybody stop and think about whether this is a good idea? Like, oh, we're going to make an artificial intelligence that contains all our information and will tell us what to do. And <laughs> I've seen movies about that. <laughs> uh, there's a military project right now talking about information gathering, data crunching, which, you know, of course, we've been, it's one of the first things we developed computers for was figuring out <laughs> figuring out how to shoot guns, how to shoot artillery angles. But it, uh, when, when you start approaching the question of letting the computer decide based on what it's been told, is this friend or foe and should we fire or not? Oh, no, 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 no. A human being needs to make that decision. To me, a human being, from a moral standpoint, a human being's got to make that decision of whether we're going to do something that may take another human being's life. Machine does not have the right to... Okay, that got way off there. Yeah. But on the basic topic that, yeah, there's got to be more to the universe than just this material that we see. <clears throat> and a lot of people are okay with that idea until it gets down to saying that there's a God who knows what you are and what you're doing, and he may not like what you're doing, <laughs> then people start kicking against it. <laughs> well, uh, let's see, let's get to Luke chapter 4. This is another place where Jesus is quoting, I think it's Isaiah again, Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That's the same, um, basically the same statement. But here Jesus is quoting from Isaiah. So here he's saying, the speaking of the spirit of the Lord being upon him. So kind of associating the spirit with the Father. Also, just as long as we're in this passage, something I would love to have been there to see. Verse 21, he began to say to them, you know, you'd read a scripture in the way they did in the synagogue. You read a scripture and then you make some comment on it. Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'd love to have seen the faces of the people when he said that. <laughs> Whatever they thought he was going to say, it wasn't that. And yeah, he's either crazy or he's the real thing. Romans chapter 8. And these are a lot of different passages and different books, but just looking at how the Holy Spirit's talked about in relation to the Father and the Son. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. And here again, the Spirit and Jesus are talked about in the same verse. So the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, that only leaves the Father. Just I don't want to make too much of that, but that kind of is implied there. And let's see. Colossians, uh, not Colossians, I can't read my own notes. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1. And verses 21, 22. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So they're speaking of his spirit. He's established us with you in Christ and put his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. They're again speaking of the, of the Father, by implication the Father. Uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. And verse 14, this is more direct, more clear. 14 through 16, Ephesians 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And so there are a number, and there are a few more, but they say basically, we draw basically the same thing from them, that there are several scriptures that speak of the spirit as the spirit of the Father. But there are also spirits, verses that speak of the spirit of the Son. Okay, we'll look at that next. And some of the, just to have some of these up here is Matthew 10, 20. Romans 8, 11. Ephesians 3, 14 through 16. Uh, about the Son and the Spirit. Acts chapter 16 and verse 7. And this is just talking about, this is kind of the travelogue part of Acts, that just talking about where they went and so forth. Acts 16, verse 7, when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So is that saying the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus? I guess so, unless you're going to say there's another spirit, and then you can't know. <laughs> we'll try to make things even more complicated. 
So Acts 16, 7 seems to speak of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus. And we know that there are other places in Acts where the Holy Spirit told them, no, don't go here, go there. And also with Philip, he told him, you need to go out to the road and my road that goes down to, uh, well, wherever and meet the Ethiopian. So the Holy Spirit had this role with them in the book of Acts of telling them, go here and not there. So here he's called the Spirit of Jesus. And Galatians 4, 6. And that's always been before Philippians, so I'm going to try that. Galatians 4, 6. Because you are sons, God has, spent, has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So there again, and speaks of the Spirit of the Son. And there are a couple of others, and we don't, they, they will can tell us the same thing, basically. Philippians, Philippians 1.19 speaks of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 1.11 talks about the Spirit of Christ. And there, Peter's talking about the prophets of the Old Testament. Verse 11 says, Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So there are times when the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. Now in that verse, obviously Peter's referring to the Holy Spirit as the one who reveals the word to men to write down, as that is consistently, uh, consistently taught. But then there are some times where the Spirit and the Son have a, it sometimes, it, it, it almost sounds, and people almost, I think, want to take the idea that the Spirit, I want to be careful how I say this, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but it almost comes across from some people that the Spirit is like the, the, the go-between person that the Father sends or the, or the Son sends to go do errands or something. I don't mean to sound disrespectful, of course. But there are times also when the Spirit was telling the Son what to do. Now that's, that's kind, of, kind of odd. I better back that up quickly, hadn't I? Uh, Luke chapter 4 Luke chapter 4 and verse 1. And this is right before the temptation. I've never been real good at organizing what I write on the board, so there's not some kind of great plan that I have in mind. I've, I've always kind of been doing that part as I go, depending on, it's an old habit based on the way I used to teach music, and kind of have to take that as it, <laughs> depending on what direction you go with certain things. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. So here Jesus is led by the Spirit. So the Spirit isn't some, the Spirit's not, you know, the, the, some junior partner in the Trinity there. I mean, there the Spirit is taking Jesus and saying, now go into the wilderness. So the Spirit is directing Jesus. And in Mark, when Mark talks about this, it even, yeah, Mark is before Luke. Ah, I had plenty of sleep, but it didn't seem to do any good. 
Mark chapter 1, verse 12. Excuse me. Mark 1, 12 says the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. That's, uh, you know, if, if it were me and it said that the Spirit drove David into the wilderness, it would sound like, well, I had to do what he said. And it's, at least it's, it's, uh, it's more than just a gentle suggestion you may want to go out into the wilderness now. <laughs> it's more like this is what we're doing now. I that's that's there in the Bible, and that's kind of a. But it, it maybe it helps us see that there is an equality, at least between the Son, the Spirit, and the Father, in a way that we maybe misunderstand sometimes through the way that they choose to work, the way that they chose to work. Verse fourteen of Mark of uh, Luke four says that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. And we get some other we get some other verses like that that uh, talk about um, we've already seen of Jesus being um, anointed with the Spirit of Jesus casting out by the power demons by the power of the Spirit. So it and of course that's not to not to say that the power that Jesus didn't have power without the Spirit, but that. There was a unity of how they worked together, certainly, that, that the Spirit was involved in his works. Then there's some places that, there's places where the Spirit's talked about, and it's just not really clear if it's, it's not, you know, clear if it's speaking of uh, the Father or the Son. An interesting one to look at, though. <laughs> An interesting one to look at here is Romans 8, 9. Just in terms of how, and we always have to remember that the Holy Spirit chose in revealing the Word. That's such a curious, puzzling thing, how the different people writing the Bible, they don't all write the same. John has a way of talking, doesn't he? <coughs> kind of in circles. <laughs> kind of, he comes around and talks about it again, then he goes to something else, comes back around again. It almost reminds me of, uh, of a musical structure sometimes in John, uh, more than a narrative. But uh, then Peter, First Peter, he's, just, he's got a, just a real straightforward way of talking, you know, like you'd imagine Peter would, old fisherman, and um, just a kind of take charge man. And Paul, of course, has his way of talking where he goes on. And you think, if he was saying this, he'd have to stop to breathe. But since it's written, he doesn't have to. And his sentences just go on forever. But the one spirit inspires them all, using each different person's personality and ability. And yet choosing, doing that in a way that their words come out to say exactly what the Spirit means for them to say. So every word that was breathed out by the Spirit, by God through the Spirit to them, was chosen for its purpose. In Romans 8, 9, look what that says. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So there it sounds like it's saying both <laughs> at that one time. So, okay, I'll just take that and... That's kind of like when Jesus refers to the choice of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. The choice of the kingdom is thinking about the same thing. Right. You know, he's talking about the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ. Mm-hmm. We could... One the same spirit. Sure. We could use, and, and we can use, I guess we use different ways of speaking about our human relationships. Uh, as I might call my wife, my wife, my companion, my friend, um, my love, 
you know, describing different aspects of the relationship. Partner, as when um, we're paying for something and one of us gets to the card the fastest there and I see which one of us is going to pay for it. Well, it all goes to the same place. So <laughs> we've always done it that we've always done it that way. Now that's that's just the way we've done it. And I'll I'll joke with the person uh, checking the the salesperson. Sometimes say we've been a we've been incorporated for many years. So <laughs> we've been a corporation for many years. So that that money all goes to the same place. So different ways of describing the different relationships. I guess in, in summary, more often than not, uh, of all the different times where the Spirit, I saw the Spirit described as Spirit of God, Spirit of the Father, Spirit of Christ, most often it's just Spirit of God, and a few more times relating to the Father. But also, the spirit of Jesus is there, so it's not just a real clear sort of thing. And uh, next time we'll talk about how the, the spirit being sent by the Father and being sent by the Son and what that, what that means. And that gives me some time to look at that again and see if I can understand it any better, maybe. Thank you for being here.